So what we're gonna talk about today is making your system on a spar descendable. In the ANSI standards, it says that if you do not have a top to the tree, a lateral limb, anything like that, you have to use a choke system. Um, now, what is a choke system? Uh, there's several ways to do it. It doesn't always mean that you need a cinching knot in order to do it. Uh, so we'll go through a couple of things and we're gonna try to keep it pretty simple because I'm not a believer in you can throw aluminum at every problem and need to buy specific gear for every, every situation. You can do a lot with your components that you have. So this might be a little bit difficult to see uh, from where you're at. So feel free to come in closer as we, uh, as we do stuff here and ask questions as we go, please. So how many people climb on moving rope systems? Okay, cool. I'm guessing this is the SRS corner over here. Thanks for paying attention. Okay, so working down a removal, we've, made, uh, we've blown out our top. There's nothing left for us to tie into, no lateral limbs. What do we do? We've gotta figure out a choke system because, I don't even know why I put this up there. Just simply, Imagine this union wasn't here. Just work with me on this one. Uh, if we're on a straight pole here, there's, there's nothing to keep me, if I gaff out, something happens, all this is gonna do is slide down with me, okay? So if something goes wrong, I need to be able to sit back, get down, engage my friction hitch system, whatever uh, it might be, whatever system you're using. Uh, that is, and there's a reason for it being in the ANSI standards. A long time ago, somebody told me that um, uh, every ANSI standard was, you know, written in somebody else's injury or fatality. And I thought that was a little bit dramatic at first, but now I work with the ANSI committee and I'm telling you it is 100% true. Um, so if there's a rule in ANSI, there is good cause for it. Do you have to back up a running bowling for life support? Yes, you do. You can tie a figure eight underneath it, you can put a carabiner underneath it, you can back it up pretty much however you want. But um, the reason why, uh, from what I've uh, been told is, uh, as it's loaded and unloaded, it has a tendency to loosen up and make that tail creep in. The reason why you don't really need to when you're rigging is because you bomb into it once and then it gets untied. So if you're using a bowline for uh, uh, life support, just make sure you're putting some kind of a backup into it. Um, and you can do that multiple ways. Even a figure eight underneath it uh, will be sufficient. So now we're in a situation where I do have a choke system. So if I gaff out, or something like that, I'm not gonna go down uh, on the pole. But then there is the problem of, I've just got a regular friction hitch here. So using nothing else other than what I had, you can just throw a munter underneath it to give yourself the added friction that you're gonna need uh, in order to get down without your hitch locking up or burning. Um, now, the beauty of this system is I added nothing from uh, my moving rope system. All I did was take my termination carabiner, move it down here. I had to learn one knot to do this system. And I'm completely compliant, completely descendable. It's not retrievable, but generally if you're bombing out because of an emergency, retrieving your line is probably not your highest priority. Um, and the other thing I do like about the Munter is it is bi-directional, so you can tend it if you need to and flip it back over. So if for some reason you gotta go back up, you can maintain on this one. All right, another one that I see frequently, uh, pushing a bite through one of the lower D-rings, which is, you can do. Um, 
since you're just adding friction, what I don't like about it is one, you're putting carabiner into a shear position, which it's not gonna fail uh, in this configuration. But the other thing that you're doing is you're, you've got a bunch of moving cordage close to stationary straps and your bridge. Why not move it a little bit further away with a Munter hitch, right? Another simple way to do it, it's a ring. If you don't feel like a Munter hitch, or you don't know one, rings are simple, add friction, no problem. Problem is, is they have a tendency to lock up until you lift up here. So you could be uh, tending two points on your way down if you needed to. Now, one of the most versatile tools that I have found, and I keep finding new ways to use it, is the adjustable friction saver. You can do so many things with this, uh, with this friction saver. Um, there's the standard you know, two ring ones that are just flat webbing that are stitched together. You can't change anything. Uh, there's the fancy ones that have the pulley that passes through. There's the one that Petzl has that, uh, I don't know, needs a really great tech manual understanding. Um, but if you're on a moving rope system and you have a friction saver, because everybody uses friction savers, right? All the time? No. Um, what you can do is where, if you were through a branch union, you know, you would want some space there. But because we're using it for a different purpose, we want to pass this prusik around a little bit further. This is really small. Okay, there we go. Then, I heard somebody else say four inches is the magic number. Take that for what you will. But it leaves some separation here so that way when you weight the system, it's gonna uh, squeeze it together. And uh, the, the bark abrasion against is gonna, is gonna hold it together. This is totally fine as a, uh, as a cinch choked system. And it is you know, just as retrievable as anything else. With a retrieval ball or an overhand knot, you can still pull this one out. Um, so if you're not comfortable switching over to stationary and you've got an adjustable friction saver, you can start with this one easily. So another, uh, another one out from Buckingham. Uh, if you are spiking up something that uh, doesn't have scaffold branching really, and you don't have a tie-in point, this is called the tree squeeze. And this is really the, uh, the only application I've found for this. It's not as, you don't want to use this in the uh, upper canopy of the tree the same way we did with that one. Um, but the handy part about it is if you're flip lining up on something, The, the stiffness of, um, of the main part of the lanyard, you can really flip that with you. Because uh, that is one of the only positive things I can think of for uh, wire core lanyards, is being able to flip them as you're, as you're moving up. Other than that, I think wire cores are kind of an antiquated thing to use. Um, also because there's really no way uh, to, to set up uh, a lanyard which is some, uh, for um, a secondary system, which is something that we're going to talk about tomorrow. But uh, if you're doing palms, if you're doing uh, you know, real straight pines or something like that, and you're spiking up from the bottom, this is, this is a great product just for that.
Because as if you gaff out, it's going to squeeze around. So it's a little bit one dimensional, uh, depending on what you're doing. So back when, a million years ago, everybody used to want to keep this system that you shouldn't be using below it, it wouldn't come off the top. Now, if you're choking a system, you want to have it above your rigging. Uh, people are finding also that if you have your block here and you're, uh, and you're negative rigging into it, uh, the block as it uh, stretches that sling, pinch or sever your line. So stay above it. Give yourself a little bit of room between, uh, between your rigging so that way you can get that choked system in. You really don't need much room in order to install it. Make sure when you do have this uh, choked system going that you're pulling against the bite of the line. If you move around this way, you're gonna end up opening the knot, right? And sometimes if you're doing uh, larger, larger trees and you have to move around side to side, thimble prusik, floating anchor, whatever you might have, Really handy tool. This is going to help you stabilize as you move around. It'll uh, tension it both ways. So as you're using a saw on the spar, not everything is always straight up and down. So what you're going to end up doing is sometimes you're going to ha uh, have an awkward spot where you're going to be cutting versus trying to get in a comfy spot to cut. Um, I recommend that if you have uh, one of those kind of awkward off-balance cuts, um, start it in the awkward spot when you can still be secured up above. You can, you can remain secured up above your cut as you're uh, starting the notch. Um, so you would want to work your way around to uh, start the cut and then reposition so that way you're making your back cut when the wood's gonna be moving uh, in order to remain clear of it. This very simple system that we did, uh, the adjustable friction saver, that was retrievable. Um, how do we make this one retrievable? You can use the tail and uh, capture it here so that way when you're done you can pull it down. Um, you can actually just leave, uh, you just have to be more aware of how much rope you have running through things. Um, one of the other things that you also can do not fond of this one because it leaves so much rope in front of you as you're working, but you can go down on this one and the deflection of the rope going up plus that little bit of friction right there actually gives you enough to where you don't need to uh, add any friction onto this one. And then if you need to get to the ground, you've got this totally retrievable. You can pull it back towards you with just these legs aligned. Um, it works well with an eye splice. Otherwise, you can tie just about anything right there. Uh, a couple of different ways to fight against a lean. And most of them are with your lanyard. Um, and like I said, start if you're making a cut, start on the awkward side. Um, but this is, I'd say, one of the it's common-ish. You can uh, just flip it over. It's not going to cinch down, but what it's going to do is it's going to provide some friction here and around, so that way you're not going to wiggle too much. Uh, you're not, your lanyard's not going to slide. You can keep yourself stable this way, too, uh, by double wrapping it. But the problem is, is it's not going to move with you at all. So now I'm uh, taut over here and uh, loose on this side. So if you are, you're going to have to rotate it. And if you're on larger wood, that's going to be a colossal pain. Uh, and when, you, um, when you're actually making your back cut, you'd probably want to take this off and configure it differently, uh, just so that way you're not pinching your own line in case uh, you got to get down quickly or something. Another quick, easy way to configure your lanyard so that way uh, you've got it in a stable position. It's not going to move very uh, easily, but you can always pull it towards you 
do this, and re-cinch it. So if you're on a larger diameter stem, this works uh, pretty well. On something this size, it's going to be a little clunky. But floating anchors, like we were talking about, a lot of things you can do with them. Here's one more. And you know, you're not loading this against the uh, trunk, but it's also just a positioning aid at this point. It's not really load bearing. But the beauty of this one is you can scoot this back, move around, put more tension on it, and it, to help you get into that comfortable, safe cutting spot. All right. Mike, thank you so much for talking about spar positioning. Um, I know I got a lot out of it. I'm sure everybody else did as well. Anybody has any questions, come up and see Mike. Uh, and then we got Petzl doing an unboxing here next. And then one of my best friends, Ryan Torsicola, will be finishing out the day doing some advanced canopy anchors. Definitely want to come over here and check it out uh, at the Trainer's Test Kitchen.